morning, everybody. Welcome back to Westbridge. It's great to see you all here. If you're joining us online, uh, we're glad that you are here with us also as we worship our God together. We just want to start our time in worship just reminding you, reminding us who we are in Christ. So I just want to read a little bit from 1 Peter 2, just as a call to worship for us today. In 1 Peter 2, in verse 4, it says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house or temple of the Holy Spirit to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Amen. We have been called out of darkness into God's wonderful light so that we might declare God's praise. And so let's stand and let's do that together this morning.
For you know that it is not with perishable things like silver or gold that you were redeemed, but by the blood of Christ, the perfect lamb without blemish or defect. We just want to pause and just take a minute to celebrate that. As we sing. Worthy is the lamb. See. Be cool. 
crown you now with many crowns. You reign Victoria. I am lifted up. Jesus, Son of God, the treasure of heaven.
read Psalm 18 too for us as we wrap up this time of worship. It says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. God, we come to you today, our rock, our refuge, our stronghold, our salvation. We declare today that uh, salvation is only found in Jesus, in faith in Jesus. We believe today that your grace is sufficient for us today, God, that your work on the cross is sufficient for us today, that we can enter by the blood of the Lamb into your presence. So, God, we thank you for that. We thank you that you are our shield, that you are our protector, that you are our provider. And so we come today as your people who once had not received mercy, but God, we have now received mercy through Christ. And we come today to give you glory and to worship you and to hear from you. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Man, well, good morning, church family. It's good to be together today. We continue our comeback message series. This is week three. And looking back, week one, the focus was, as we come back together, that we would live with a renewed focus on Jesus Christ crucified. And just that, it was 1 Corinthians 2-2 where Paul says, you know, when I was with you, church, in Corinth, my message was simply this, Jesus Christ crucified. For it says, our eyes are fixed on our Lord crucified. We're reminded of God's love for us, or God proves his love for us, and we respond with, with love to him. As we look to Christ crucified, our pride is uh, obliterated, isn't it? We're humbled as we think about what he did, and, and then him humbling himself and calling us into that. And then our our uh, life mission is clarified, our calling is clarified, as we, we hear him say, take up your cross, follow me, this is the way that we go. Last week, we looked at, uh, the, the challenge was to come back with a renewed passion to share the hope that we have in Christ with those who are far from him. So, eyes fixed on Christ, and then, okay, our job, really, or our mission while we're here is to share this hope that we have with those who may not know him, and we went to Colossians 4, verses 2 to 6, and just really practical advice on where we were challenged to be praying for somebody, we were challenged to be ready to share our faith, to share our own unique faith story, and then we were challenged to uh, be living it in the way that, where he says, okay, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders, make the most of every opportunity, and let your conversation be always full of Anybody remember what that word was? Grace! And how much do we need that right now in this time of life where we have all these opinions going and, and there's, um, we can be tempted to not speak with grace. So just like I was thinking, one of my favorite dishes right now is chicken fried rice. And you put that soy sauce on that into that dish and it flavors every piece of rice goes brown, right? So just let grace flavor our speech. Every word is like soy sauce or, or uh, Chick-fil-A chicken nuggets. And you know that sauce? When you dip that chicken nugget in that creamy good chicken Chick-fil-A sauce, that's like grace on every word that we say as we go out. God's saying, hey, as you go out, let your conversation be full of grace as you interact with those around. This is prime time, is it not? You my brothers and sisters, to be sharing our faith and to be ready to be a light and share the hope that we have in Christ. As, you know, every day people are thinking about death and disease and the, the reality that we're all headed there someday and there's fear and just great opportunities. As we begin to re-enter life and one of the prime ministry opportunities for us in this culture is the gift of game and sport. And what a, see, a Chris Chiodo, our, our uh, commissioner of Little League back here, and man, a couple weeks ago to drive into Ellis Park and see the fields filling up with baseball again, and sports starting to go again, and just the gift of game. What's the gift of game? It's the opportunity to build relationships with each other, enjoy life, but for us as followers of Christ, 
to, to also have an avenue to share the hope we have in Christ. And so, great opportunities there. Aubrey Wicker gave a speech, a salutatorian speech on Friday night at Cascade High School that was one of the best illustrations of Colossians chapter 4, making the most of every opportunity, but with wisdom. It was, she shared her faith, her love for the Lord in a way that was so appropriate to the, the occasion. You know, sometimes when someone like changes the occasion and they go into kind of preaching and it gets awkward and weird, none of that at all. It, it was just, you, I think this is online at Cascade, isn't it? Go online, watch it, and what you find yourself doing is saying, if I didn't have what Aubrey has, I want some of that. I want to go talk to her about what is this love of Christ that you're talking about. It is so good. It'll fire you up, not only to go out and live one moment at a time and, uh, and help the world, but, but to share your faith. So, neat opportunity there. Well, today's text is about what will lead us into coming back together with a renewed love for the body of Christ. Our text today will give some theological framework around what we were feeling during that time of, of quarantine when we had to be apart from one another. Some of us are still apart and in process of coming back together, which we probably will be for a while. But I don't know if you felt that. It was really neat, on one hand, to gather as a family unit and worship God together. And we had some of the most precious Sunday worship times as a family that I'm sure we'll, we'll ever have. But even as wonderful as that was, being with our family unit, we were missing the body. We, we, we had this growing longing to be back with the church. Why was that? Now, it, and what it reminded me of was the time in college. Tam and I have been dating for four years. As This might be a guy thing, but I just woke up one day and realized, I think I was a sophomore in college, like, she might be the one I'm going to marry. And I've only dated her. And any big decision, you should check out the options. So I should probably break up, date some other people just to make sure she's the one. And so I think it was Christmas break that I'm still I'm, uh -oh, breaking up some bad memories. <laughs> but I broke up and said, hey, the, uh, I'm going to go, you know, check out the, the field there at Cedarville and see if, if there's another girl that I should marry. Well, it took me three weeks <laughs> to realize I was deeply in love with this girl and I didn't want to spend another day of my life with any other girl. And and uh, she was gracious enough to take me back. But while we were apart, my, my love grew. Absence made my heart grow fonder. Or I, my love grew. And so, I don't know, we felt that, didn't we? Uh, and we're feeling that. As the body of Christ, we, we, uh, we need each other. Why? Truth is powerful. When we see it, it doesn't just inform us. It transforms us. Romans chapter 12, 2 says, don't conform to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Then you'll know how to live your life. God's pleasing, perfect um, will. Today's truth gives that framework, explains why we were, were longing to be back together. But it does more than that. It, it's powerful to ignite or renew our devotion to the body of Christ. To play the part that God's called us to play in his body. It's ironic that it's written to uh, a church that's actually going through some hard times. They're not doing so well as a faith family. It's Corinth, Corinth, the church in Corinth, and we'll pick it up in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul's talking about the, the really spiritual gifts. When we come to Christ, we each receive a gift to, to serve the body, and they were having some uh, issues with this. And so we'll pick it up in verse 12. He says, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its parts form one body, so it is with the body of, with Christ, or with the body of Christ. Okay, here's the truth. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body. And what he's talking about here is that moment of conversion, when we turn to faith, turn to Christ in faith. The spirit of God, it's the picture of baptizing us into a the, the church into a, a body, the family of God in that moment. And he says, whether we were Jew or Gentile, so whatever our ethnicity, whether we are slave or free, here he's talking about the socioeconomic um, divisions that arise among us. None of that matters, for we were all given the one spirit to drink. And then if you'd 
uh, look down at, at verse 27. This is a summary verse of the whole passage that we'll be looking at today, and then it also pivots into what he's about, what he'll say next. But it says this. Now, you are the body, speaking plural, you plural are the body of Christ, and each, so he goes plural, but then he also goes singular. Each one of you is a part of it. The big idea today is this, and big idea in this text, you are the body of Christ. Each one of you is a part of it. This is a core truth that, that many of us have heard, many of us know this passage, maybe like, yeah, yeah, I heard that. But today, may I encourage us just to, to really let this soak in. We are the body of of Christ and each one of us a member of his body if Jesus were to say hey were to say I'm gonna come and, and uh, have dinner with you today man it, it, that'd be a moment right like if he was with us and we'd cook a very nice dinner we'd, we'd do everything we could to take care of him we, the church, the gathering, is the body of Christ. And where is he here on earth right now? Each member, each one of us, a member of his body. Radical um, truth as we allow it to, to soak in. This is our identity, one body, diverse parts, connected in love to do what God's called us to do. So you ask the question during COVID, why were we longing to be together? Longing to worship together and to connect together. And we were able to keep doing that in some ways through video and small groups, but still there was this, there's something about coming together. Why? It's as simple as a thumb being amputated from a hand. <laughs> it, we, God, our idea, we have been recreated in Christ spiritually we are one body. This is who we are. This is our identity. This is, this is core, and it changes how we see church, how we talk about church, how we treat each other. It, it, it's core to this life. So here's the, the question. If this is true, what are the implications that play out in our life and the application that we, how is this going to affect us as we go out today and as we interact with each other? And there are three implications that Paul highlights, and the God through Paul highlights in this text. Life transforming. The first one is this. Because this is true, we are the body of Christ, and each one of us a member, I will value our diversity. This is the point of verses 14 to 20, as he says in verse 14. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. This is really important for us to hear in our celebrity culture where we love the, the one, you know, the Neo in Matrix and the Rocky and Rocky and, the, the, uh, and even in church, you know, we tend to celebrate the one or the visible gifts. And he's like, guys, if, a, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. So isn't it funny how we all want to be what we're not? <laughs> I wish I had that gift. I wish I was that. If, if I'm a foot, I wish I was a hand. If I'm a hand, I wish I was the eye. And, and so we get that inferiority thing going on because I'm not like that. I guess I'm not important to the body. And God's saying here, no, you don't stop being part of the body just because you wish you were another part. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where, where would the sense of smell be? But here comes the, the truth, and this is so good. But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, or the members in the body, you and me, every one of them just as he wanted them to be. Divine design. And it's a mystery, isn't it? This is the part of the church that's so cool because it, it is mystery. Like, how does it all work? Only God. It's like we're uh, counting down the moments for Wes and Janae as their June, uh, the 24th is Janae's due date for their little one. But you know when the little one, your little one comes out, 
and you, what do you, what's one of the first things you do? You count all, do they have ten fingers and ten toes, and do they have all their parts? Who, who put those parts where they ought to go? Did we have anything to do with that? No, it, it's, it's a God thing, and it's a worship moment, isn't it, when we celebrate our kids coming out with all their parts, and the church, every church and every local church, God gives just the part just where it's needed, and, and, uh, and every part matters. Going on, if, if they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one, one body. Scholars suspect what's going on here in this young church is the valuing of one gift over another gift. We know there's many gifts of the Spirit listed in the Scripture, and there's probably more not listed. And in, within this church, they were taking one spiritual gift, probably the gift of tongues, and elevating that and saying, you're not mature until you've had this, and this is the, the main one, and he's um, combating that thinking. But it's interesting, it's, there's something in us that, that drifts towards uniformity, isn't there? Where we all want, we want to make everybody else like us. So I want, you know, you to think like I think and, and uh, see the world like I see the world, have the passions that I have, the, that I have. We, we call this uh, gift projection or ministry projection um, whatever it is that fires us up we think that ought to fire everybody else up and we uh, the danger in this is that we devalue or discount those who are not like us different personalities passions gifts and abilities and here Paul's making the point what makes a human body healthy and strong it's it's its diversity if it were all an eye it would not be able to accomplish the, its purpose. What makes a spiritual body healthy, a church family healthy? It's our diversity. And yet we tend to want to make everybody like us and, or value whatever we value. And here he's saying, no, 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 no. Value your diversity. And it'll create some frustration as people see things differently or have different passions, but it's on purpose. It's God's perfect design that we are diverse. God has uniquely shaped us. We use that shape acronym as he's given us different spiritual gifts, heart, passion, abilities, or, or A, abilities, and, and uh, gifts. P, personalities. If you've done the, recently the Enneagram's kind of been going around, but nine different personality types, nine different normal ways of seeing the world. And it's, been, it's fascinating just to think we all see it differently on purpose, and then he's given us all different experiences that, that shape us God in his wisdom and providential care has, and then places us in, in a family where we um, connect in love and, and build each other up. And what makes us strong and keeps us balanced is our diversity. I was thinking about that this week. Aren't you thankful for the people in, in your small group or in your ministry team or um, in, your, in our faith family that, that balance out your extremities or... <laughs> Those areas, where, and especially today as we all have our opinions and we can kind of drift into an extreme. And I was sitting around a campfire a couple weeks ago and I shared, here's what I really think on the issue. And when I shared what I shared, there was a corporate, whoa, glad that wasn't in your sermon notes. <laughs> I was out of balance and these guys brought me back, you know, and, and there's safety in that. Our elder team will we'll share, we elder together. Why? Because we, we all have different passion, strength, abilities, but we need each other to keep us balanced. The most da one of the most dangerous places is alone in our own mind, right? And letting our thoughts run. We need each other to, to keep one another balanced. The beauty of the body of Christ is its diversity, different parts working together to accomplish a mission. So I will value our diversity because this is true. You are the body of Christ each one of you is a part of it. Therefore, second implication, I will protect our unity. This is Paul's, or we see this calling in the second part of the, uh, this passage, verse, beginning in verse 21. Paul says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are, and this is the word to circle, in the so where the first 
part he was talking about when we get inferiority going on. This part is when we get superiority going on in our mind. Like, I don't need that person. I don't need that church. I can do life by myself. Um, and God's saying, oh, no, 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 no. In fact, the weaker parts of the body are actually indispensable. And this, the, the analogy with our body is great here. What's, when you look at a liver, is that not one of the weakest looking parts of the body you could have? It's just like this brown blob. But, but when the liver goes, game, set, match. And neat picture when, as God has designed his body, often it's the weakest. Maybe it's the person who's on, maybe not able to be with us even now, or struggling with illness, or has a spiritual gift that no one will ever notice. Or maybe they haven't been gifted with great whatever it is that we value as humans, and yet God chooses to use that person in his body to accomplish great things for his glory. He's saying, hey, um, the we, even those who seem to be weak are indispensable, and the parts that are less honorable, we, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. The, uh, he's picturing here the sexual organs, but cover those up. But we wouldn't be here, none of us would be here without parts of the body that, that, that we don't see is what he's saying. And God has, God has put the parts or the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body. But that its parts should have equal concern for each other. One part suffers and every part suffers with it. One part is honored and every part rejoices with it. So, we resolve or say, because this is true, I will protect our unity. The, the truth in this text is we need one another. And God has created us to be interdependent as we do life together and as we follow Christ together. Every member matters. And those that seem to be weaker are actually indispensable. Aren't you thankful that it's a faith thing, but, but God has put each part of the body where it needs to be and given each of us the role that, that he wants us to play at, at this season in our life. And it, it changes throughout life. I, you know, it's the, the roles that we play within his body. But our job is, is to simply value each member of the body, protect the unity, honor and um, keep the body together. And as we do that, then uh, the body is strong and accomplishes what, what, it's, what, what God would have us accomplish in this time and place. I love it how this is, this is anti, or uh, when Paul says, don't conform to the world, but be transformed. Um, this is not like the world, is it? The world has the value system where we honor certain people, and, but in the church, everyone is, of equal honor and I was flashing back to the moment when uh, Donald Trump got, called uh, the, I think it's McLean Bible Church where uh, David Platt's pastor like 30 minutes out and said hey I, I'm coming or his people called the, his, their people and I'm coming to church today and David Platt had a dis quick decision to make and did a great job I thought he said all right he he said all right, he knew he was going to be a political pawn in the moment, but he uh, went ahead and he read the passage, we're, we're supposed to pray for our leaders, and he had the president on stage. He held the Bible above the president's head and prayed over the president, which is a great move. But I was thinking, we've had time to think about this. If we got a call from the White House, the president's going to be here today. He doesn't even come up on stage unless, you know, there was a purpose for that, but in terms of honor, he sits exactly where everybody else sits, and he has no more honor than one of our children or anybody else, any of us. We are all equally honored in, in the body of Christ. Isn't that a cool thing about this body, what you just love about the, uh, not, and Peter calls us to honor our authorities and those types of things, and we would do that appropriately, but I just love the way it's the body of Christ. So where do you suppose the enemy's coming at us? He wants to disrupt our 
our unity through pride, where we think more highly of ourselves than we ought. We say, I can do life without this person, or I can hold a grudge, and, and where there's a hurt, I don't need them. I can disconnect from the body of Christ. And he comes at us in those moments. And so the challenge for us is to protect our unity. And if I could just challenge us as a church family, may we, as we come back together, and as we go through these crazy days where every week something's changing, may we commit and resolve, I will protect the unity of the body of Christ. I will agree, we'll have differences on all kinds of things, but I will, uh, one thing I will value and that I will do is protect the unity of the body of Christ. In our church family, we call this, our motto is, in essentials unity, in the core essentials of the doctrine of the faith, there must be unity. And, and there are certain things we would separate over and take a bullet for. But in non-essentials, all those preferences, liberty. So how you want to raise your kids and, you know, your views on this, that, the other, and, and to wear a mask or not wear a mask. And, and by the way, please, if we, we want this to be a safe place. And I know we're, I'll talk about that a little later, but, but wherever you land on these types of things, um, any, there's liberty, right? And then in all things, charity. In essentials, unity. and non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity or love. And when we do hurt one another, May we be quick to forgive as Christ forgave us. It's neat in the body of Christ, conflicts are actually opportunities to practice forgiveness and, and uh, grace and to glorify God even as we work through things together and, and uh, we protect our unity. So one of the exciting initiatives that's coming in August that's really been an outflow of the season of quarantine is our elder team said, hey, let's go ahead and we have 20 elders Let's divide our church family up into 20 groups, and you could call them even many micro churches, and where one elder will be praying weekly for that group and then checking in on that group every quarter. And that's going to start in August. And so everyone who's a member of this church family, you are going to be, you're going to have an elder. An elder is the same as a pastor, and some are paid, some aren't, but they're all pastors or elders, and they're going to spiritually be praying for your family, praying for you, and um, making sure that, that you're okay. And we don't want any member facing a challenge alone or slipping through the cracks. Isn't that cool? So um, that's one of the initiatives that, that really flows out of the reality that we're the body of Christ, and we need to protect our unity and, and, and uh, care for one another. And then the third implication that we see in this text comes out of verse 27 as he says, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And the focus is on that last part. Each one of you is a part of it. Therefore, implication three, I will play my part. One of my favorite memories growing up was Leedy Ball down at Ellis Park. And remember a summer morning, you know, we'd hop on our bikes right down to Ellis Park and line up on the third baseline for uh, Mr. Johnson and Mr. Uh, Trotter to pick teams. And they'd pick the teams, and you know, you'd go running out on the field, and be like, where do you want me to play, Mr. Johnson? And he'd say, you know, right field. And so you'd go running out, and it felt so good to be picked, chosen, and then have a position to play. My brothers and sisters, we have been chosen by God. God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. But not just chosen, but placed in his body sovereignly to play a part that matters indispensable every one of us as we step in and, and play that part and so the question is am i playing my part am i bringing my best am i connecting with the body and and playing the, the part that god's created me to play so what's that look like it starts by just showing up when the body gets together being present we see in the New Testament, Jesus lived this way. The New Testament models this. The, the pattern is big group, small group, big group, small group. They gathered in big group for worship, small group to connect in, in with one another. And through the COVID time, I think we learned and we felt this as an, a leadership team. Guys, we have got to be in small group community. It is possible to come to big group worship, and this is important. This is like the family meal, and God leads us all through his word, and it's a chance to, to love on each other and, and, and love on, express our love to him through music and all these things. But you can come to big group worship and never really connect with the body of Christ. 
You can live on the fringe, but you never have that relationship. When the dark cloud of COVID came in on during March and lights went out and we had to stop meeting together, who are you talking to? Family, small group. And it, it just challenged us that if somebody is part of Westbridge but doesn't have a small group, we want to help facilitate that. Pastor Tyson oversees our small group ministry, which we'll be regrouping in August. August is that time we just kind of regroup, and anybody who doesn't have a group or wants to switch a group, that's the time to do it. And so I um, encourage you to be thinking, praying. If you're not in a group or if you are in a group, just a renewed passion. This is where the body of Christ connects in relationship to care for one another. And so um, excited for, for what's coming with that. Sometimes uh, thinking about playing the part that God's given us to play in the season of life that we're in. Do you ever, sometimes we, pride starts messing with us a little bit and we're like, I just don't like the part that you've given me to play, God. And how do you get through those moments and battle the pride that you're struggling I, and I, I struggle with? Can I just remind us of the why? And this is part of how this truth just fuels us to, to devote ourselves to the body of Christ. Why play our part in the body of Christ? It really comes down to love for him, doesn't it? He gave his body for us, and he saved us, he redeemed us, he chose us, and it's really just at, out of gratitude for what he's done for us. We don't deserve any of this. But why else play your part, my part in the body of Christ? It's also the, uh, the only way that sometimes you hear people say you can't follow Jesus alone. The idea is, when you stop and think about your life mission, the only way to truly live out your life calling is as part of the body, interdependent. So it's really stepping into the joy of living out the purpose God created you to live. It's going to happen in community. And then third, it's just for te the sake of team. Um, when, you know, like when I... Uh, <laughs> Think about Leedy Ball, you know, and when one kid gets put out in right field, say, and he wanted to play shortstop, and he just gets ticked, and, and uh, you know, they go hit the ball out in right field, and that kid's still moping around because he didn't get to play shortstop, and just lets the ball go over his head, and then throws his mitt down and walks out and gets the ball. What's the rest of the team doing? Come on, man. <laughs> We're losing because of you. The bases are, you guys are running around the bases. But what's the team that wins? It's the team where I don't care where you put me, Lord. I'm just glad to be on the playing field and just shows up and plays the part. Greatness in the kingdom of God isn't doing great things for God. It's being faithful to play whatever part God has given each one of us for his glory, right? That's the calling that, that he's given us. So the conclusion, or bringing this all together, big idea. You are the body of Christ, each one of us is a part of it, indispensable. Therefore, I must value our diversity, protect our unity, and play my part. What if, church family, and this is where it just gets exciting, what if everyone in our church family gets lit up with this truth? And as we come back together, it's with a renewed love for the body of Christ. What if? What would happen? I've asked Doug to come on up and share, and Doug Wicker and Abby, um, so appreciate their ministry. Is Doug is the guy that God appointed over the past two years to lead our elder team. And he, uh, it's been neat watching God's grace flow through him as, through this COVID season. It's been one example where we haven't missed a beat. We've continued to meet and actually accelerate and it, through our ministries. But one of the things I've observed about how God has gifted Doug is he truly believes this truth and values the whole team. Everyone on the, the, our elder team and in the church family matters. And he'll pass the ball to, to another guy and, and trust him to run. And God works through that. And a couple weeks ago, Doug shared something after he got back together. And so I just asked if he'd be willing to come and encourage us. Good morning, church family. Um, yeah, God has uh, really been working and teaching, still teaching, and I'm still learning. So still, still working through 
um, just just how awesome it is to be a part of the body of Christ. Um, I've come to realize over the last few months one of the most vulnerable and dangerous places, John has said uh, this morning, is within my own mind, right? But but the other piece of that, as I've thought about that, is it's without my church family too, and the value that you bring to the team, my pride, selfishness, my schedule, my time, all those things start to take over as I'm away from from you guys. Everything shifts from serving the king to serving the king the way I want to serve the king. And Dakota could probably come up and give you a few testaments to that. Um, but as I've gathered back together, I told John, as we gathered back in this, in this um, service, you know, a few weeks ago and got down on our knees and prayed in this room, I was overwhelmed by the value of the body. I was just truly overwhelmed by all the things that you guys have done for me and for my, for my family. I see here, I could, I could walk around the room and I could tell you how you've played a role in my family, my church, my, how the church has played a role in my family's lives. I think of, I, I wrote down a few names. So I, I thought of Rick Jones um, this morning and his faithful service, um, consistent faithful service, and you never see him, you never hear anything. I think of Jim Harold in the back, always being here, always welcoming, always giving a hug, or he's, he's getting back to giving hugs. <laughs> I think of Gail Hayes and her prayer and her, her the prayer warrior she is. Rick Baker and his faithfulness and just the, the love and passion of the Word of God in his life. Rex and Rosalie Wilson, Steve and um, Sandy Tope and their love um, for each other and their love for the Lord and how that inspires me to want to love my wife and love the Lord at the same time as well. And I think of this guy and his love, his mercy, his grace that he pours out into his um, church family every day. It just, it overwhel it's overwhelming when you get really close to his heart. He, his love for this church is unbelievable. Um, you know, as, as we've come back together, it's overwhelming to me the need for the body of Christ. My, my deep need inside of me for this body, um, serving the king together in the capacity. It encourages me greatly as we are back together to stand firm in the faith, to fight the good fight, and to go and make disciples. And I, as John mentioned, Aubrey um, graduated Friday night, and um, we... Uh, she made me cry again. <laughs> so, but, but I can take you to each one of my children, and I can think of times in my life when I stopped and I thought, wow, what, where did they get that from? And it occurred to me as I was thinking through this this morning, it was, it's from the body. It's from you guys. It's from each and every one of you pouring into my family. And I would say thank you. Thank you all. So what's the next step in your life? And maybe you've been listening today and realize I'm not a part of the body of Christ. I haven't trusted Christ as my Savior. And that invitation is open today. And Jesus says, believe in, in who he is and what he's done for us on the cross. Maybe you've been living on the fringe and your next step would be to engage in the body and become a member of Westbridge or whatever church God's calling you to. And we have our... Uh, Connect 101 coming up in September, but I encourage you just throw on the team jersey. Join, join the uh, team. We have a, a roster spot for you. We're praying for 100 new members this ministry season and would love to have you. Maybe your next step is to join that small group and just say, I'm going to risk a relationship and by faith step in and be a part of the body of Christ. Today we're excited to welcome Megan, Ella, and her kids into our church family officially as, as, a, as a member of our, our church here at Westbridge. But it was neat to hear Megan share her story and um, has gone through a hard time. She's 
not her desire, but a single mom now. And she made a commitment, though, because her mom, who was single with four kids, made a commitment. When she was young, her mom committed to take her to church every week. And not that we get brownie points with God for being at church every week, but there's something about being with the body of Christ that God uses. And it was through that, at age fourth, fifth grade, she placed her faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And Megan has made that same commitment as a mom. And Megan, are you in this service? You should probably be in next service. But throughout COVID, I, when we did our drive-in service, <laughs> that was that was an absolute disaster in my mind in terms of effectiveness, whatever. But you know the positive, one positive was seeing you, many of you there in your cars, but I remember seeing Megan in her minivan right there. And it just, I remembered her saying, I have decided I am going to have my children in the body of Christ every week. And she's been here when we were in the gym. She's here. She's here. And I believe God's going to honor that commitment and these kids are precious. If you've gotten to know them, they go to Cascade, which we love. We want to be a school or a church reach in all the schools. And so some more cadets in the house. But uh, if you see her, give her a, a warm welcome and appreciate Bree Schaffner being the friend that invited her to, to come to Westbridge. Thank you for, for uh, worshiping with us. It's been good, hasn't it? This text, I encourage you to go back, meditate on this and and uh, let's thank the Lord for it now. Father, we thank you for your word to us today. Just uh, reframing our view of reality and our identity, being reminded that we are your body, Jesus, and each one of us an indispensable part. Help us to value our diversity, protect our unity, and each one of us to play our part for your glory. Lord, I thank you for each member of this body and just pray your blessing over each one that's here in person or at home watching. And I pray especially for Megan and her kids, Lord, and I thank you for leading her to Westbridge and just pray that, that this would be a season of, of great spiritual fruit in her life and the life of her children and let her feel like she's a part and, and uh, just provide for her your grace through the body here. Lord, as we bring you our, our offering, our tithes of, of uh, actual money, but also just our, our offering of our very lives, we do so in response to all that you've given us, to think that we get to be your body here on earth. We just praise you for that. It gives us purpose and joy and, and uh, just a passion to get out and go. God, I pray that this body at Westbridge would be effective. Give us wisdom as we use the resources that you've given us. We, we need your help. We are sheep. And even this week as we make decisions, and we uh, just pray that you would guide us and direct us. Thank you for being our head, that, that we have the mind of Christ. And let us just follow you faithfully. We pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. of this song. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. And we are waiting on you, Jesus. Precious cornerstone, it's your foundation. You are faithful to the end, and we are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe. Let 
the glory of your name be the passion of the church let the righteousness of god be a holy flame that burns let the saving love of christ be the measure of our lives we believe your all to only son of god sent from and mercy at the cross and you are everything you're the promise oh Jesus you are all to us let the glory of your name and let the glory body of Christ, each one of you is a part of it. What a gift God has given us. Well, we uh, live in a world where weekly things are changing, and if there's one thing I know for sure, it's that I, there's a, I have no idea what's coming in terms of our COVID response and all that's going on, but as a faith family, we have the opportunity to model Christ through it all, and one of the pieces that we've been... <laughs> wondering and waiting for is the mask issue, right? It's just ripe for division, to wear a mask, to not wear a mask. And so I encourage us, and, and this is, I'm, earlier we heard the word of God, this is John talking, so much of what I say, just take this for what it's worth, but we have to speak into it. So 
Here are some thoughts to consider. What uh, an opportunity to show one humility, compassion, and just a, uh, a really shine out of Philippians 2 where it says, do everything without grumbling. That when a store makes me wear a mask, I just put that mask on with prayer and maybe even redeem it and say, okay, I'm going to wear this mask. And Lord, as I put, every time I put this on, I'm going to pray that you'd help me speak with grace. And then I heard a friend say, you know, if putting a mask on is help somebody else feel a little more comfortable, that's a small thing to do. Well, I would, to be compassionate. Now, I know we, we don't like to be controlled as Americans. <laughs> and there's that. And it's just interesting, isn't it, where a lot of, like with Walmart, I know Monday you have to wear a mask and Kroger is going to that. In Indiana, we are really, it feels like out of the woods, and the, the risk for us is, is relatively low. People making these decisions are at high-risk areas like Texas, and so we feel all that, and we grumble, we can be tempted to grumble about it, <laughs> but this is a chance to shine, you know, and encourage each other in that. So also as a body, just to, if you hear someone going negative, just pray for them and then say something positive. Hey. This opportunity. Life is 10% what happens to us, 90% what we make of it, right? And so this is a unique, crazy time of life to make the best of, of this season. So the question, though, is some churches are, like, making masks mandatory. Are we going to do that at Westbridge? Well, first I'll say I have no idea. <laughs> but I don't think so. And I think we, we can just say, hey, if you feel, if keep, if not having a mask is keeping you from church, please wear a mask when you come. More and more of us are coming back each week, and the areas that get congested are our hallways and stuff, and even those don't feel congested, but, but maybe we just wear a mask in our um, areas of transport, you know, in the hallways, or if you are in the vulnerable area, age group, you could just wear a mask then, or um, whatever. We'll, we'll figure this out. One of the things we're asking is, would it make sense to have a service where we all voluntarily wear masks in an overflow space like the youth room? And if that's something that you would see as value, or if you're watching from home and you say, hey, we'd come back to the gathering if, if there was a place like that, then uh, we'll, we'll try to make that happen. And we're close to making that happen. Is that as clear as mud? <laughs> These are crazy days, aren't they? But but you know what? We get to go through them together, and the Lord is guiding us and directing us as we go. So next week, we wrap up this series, final series on the comeback. It's going to be a great week, and Lord bless you as you go.